Hello, everyone. Yeah, kia ora. Yeah, delighted to be here. And uh, our first time in New Zealand. Uh, would you give a cheer for my wife, Elizabeth, uh, over there? Yeah. Yeah. As is the norm, she's the one who gets all the work done. And then I come and talk about it. And so we'll have a good time with that. Uh, it is really wonderful to be here. We've been here for about a week, and uh, I think God's up to something. I think we're discovering and learning from you many, many uh, wonderful new insights, and we've been able to be in so many different neighborhoods. Uh, I know that uh, Auckland is not Wellington. Amen, amen, and everyone... <laughs> and, and yet, and yet, even... Can anything good come from Auckland? Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I beg to tell you that uh, good things are happening, even there. Uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, firstly, for uh, caring for this beautiful place, this beautiful land, this beautiful country. And we are so grateful for you uh, allowing us to cross over from the land of Trump into this place of light and hope. And <laughs> So we are grateful, we are grateful. I have said to others, uh, I am not carrying any guns, uh, no, no, no fears for uh, your life or anything like that. Let's say a word of prayer together. Will you join me? God, so grateful to be here in this place this morning, sharing morning prayers with a household and hearing so many voices and stories in common, even from around the world, of how your spirit is moving, turning, shaking, bringing us together, bringing those who really do not belong together, who are different from one another, to face each other, to learn how to turn towards one another faithfully, and to learn how to begin to reconnect the body of Christ the body of your people, the human beings created in your image, and also to learn how to be more faithful to this land, to the trees, to the waters, to the buildings, to all these gifts that you have given to us. We're grateful for what you're doing, and we're grateful that it even happens around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's see. I'll begin by saying that... Uh, my work in the United States uh, revolves around learning how to connect expressions of all sorts. It might be a church, might be a local nonprofit, might be uh, three old women in an apartment complex caring for the place that God has called them. It might be a small business uh, where an owner says, I want my vocation to be for the healing of this neighborhood. It might be a, a single mother who every day walks her children in the park, and as she does, she walks in prayerfulness and imagination and in hope, looking how the Spirit of God is moving, stirring in the people and the places around her. And we are looking to connect together across places people who are on a journey to enter back into the fabric of everyday life and community with a healing hope of the gospel, with the good news in front of them, but also with the spirit of repentance. And we'll get to more of that in just a bit. I'll say uh, my biases right from the beginning. We'll get it out of the way so that you know where I'm coming from. I've had the huge, huge privilege over the last decade to journey in over a thousand different neighborhoods to walk the streets, share meals, have small gatherings uh, in homes, uh, visit church services like these and have conversations with everyday people. And in the journeys across both uh, the United States, Canada, many in uh, the UK, and more recently in the last five years in Australia, uh, we are discovering what I, would, what I would refer to as a hidden movement, something that God is doing 
that enlarge both the world and the church has been missing. I'll give you an example. I was walking in Newburgh, Oregon with my friend Brandon Rhodes. This is many, many years ago now. And Brandon Rhodes takes me down the main street of his neighborhood in Lentz, Portland. And he's walking me down the street and there are five church buildings progressively along the street. And he begins to show me the first one which had big boards and nails in the door. And he said, this one has closed down. Then he came to the second one uh, just, just a bit later. He says, this one has 12 people left, 12 faithful people still gathering, still hoping, but they're having a hard go of it. It could close any day. And he kept going down the row, different denominations, different uh, groups of people, and all of them were bleeding. All of them were dying. All of them were hurting. And by the time he got to the end of the street, I'm just like, Brandon, why have you done this? Why have you taken me down this path? Uh, I don't want to hear this news. And he said, but Paul, I'm not done with the tour yet. And he began to walk me through the streets, through the homes, through the parks, through the libraries, through the schools. And he began to point out character after character, person after person, follower of Jesus after follower of Jesus, who were doing all kinds of creative things to inhabit the place that God had called them to, ways they were caring for the land, ways they were caring for the least. Little, you know, from, from the kind of classic cheesy Portlandia projects of little, little libraries and, uh, you know, in front of their homes and, and sweet little park benches and things like that to, to bike repairs and things like this, all the way to the most uh, uh, normal, everyday experiences of inviting people who were different than they are to enter into their lives and into their homes and share the table together. And as we're walking through, these people were invested in every dimension of the life of the parish, the life of the place, the life of the neighborhood, from economy. They were asking the question, what might it look like if a kingdom-like economy rose up here. And let me tell you, when somebody from the U.S. invites this question, it's a hopeful thing. When someone says, how do we move from, from competition and scarcity and I got to get mine at your expense, it's a beautiful thing when a neighborhood comes together and the people of God begin to be on the lookout for those who have an imagination of God's abundance, of giving and receiving, of sharing and collaborating together. They were doing all kinds of things on behalf of the environment there. And the environment they recognized included them. It wasn't something separate. They were included because if the things around them aren't in good relationship, it affects their health. And so there, there they were asking, if the kingdom of God was to come, if thy will be done in heaven or on earth, in our plot, in our patch, here in Lentz, as it is in heaven, what would the relationship to the land and the plants and the place look like? Right? And they were asking that question. They were asking the question about education and how, what would it look like if education was more about how to help a human being become fully human, more about what does it look like for a person to fit faithfully in the ecology of relationships that exist here. How do we help a young person not think the only reason for education is so I can get mine, to how do I participate in the fabric of this place in a way that brings life healing, or as it says over 430 times throughout the scripture, shalom. That word of relational healing, right? So, my bias, my bias. Oh no. Oh boy. There we go. My bias is if this circle represents the parish, and when I say parish, I speak of this geography of relationships that includes all people, 
all the people that reside within, all the people that enter into it. It includes both followers of Christ and those who are not. It includes the land and the trees. It is essentially my bias that human beings, God had a dream for them. And that dream was that human beings would learn how to fit together hands, arms, legs, feet, sinews, coming together, fitting together in faithful relation with God, with one another, and that they would learn how their gifts, how their callings might harmonize, synergize on behalf of that place, on behalf of one another. My bias is that if you unravel this, you unravel civilization, you unravel economies, you unravel environments, you unravel civic life at the larger scale. If we can't learn how to engage faithfully here, everything else begins to unravel. It's like uh, the great economist Alvin, Alvin Toffler. Back, how many of you are old enough to remember a book called The Third Wave? Oh, you're just giving it all away. Alvin Toffler started writing about what he called prosuming, and he talked about the gift economy. And he said, imagine what it might be like if you went to a Fortune 500 meeting and you had all the wealthiest people, you know, the wealth and wealthiest businessmen, because essentially back then there weren't any women at that table, right? And you had them all at the table together and they're all doing the charts and the business and arguing back and forth and talking about brilliant things and it's all going down, but their mothers had never potty trained them. Do you see a picture of what might happen there? Is the Spirit speaking to you right now? Don't dwell on it for long. Alvin Toffler's point was when a mother has a child, she doesn't expect a quid pro quo agreement. If I teach you how to use the restroom, or in this country you call it a number of other things, the loo, the toilet, somebody else said it one, uh, pee hole was something that somebody, is that, that's not one. Okay, I'm still learning everything, I get myself in trouble. Uh, so Alvin Toffler's point was if in, in the U.S., we, if this is an iceberg, in the U.S. we measured the GDP, in other words, dollars exchanged, but Alvin Toffler's point was everything that we give and receive from one another without expecting payment. The gift economy, that thing that happens because you've built social trust and love and kindness between one another across the parish, that that which is never measured by the government, certainly not in the United States, this gift economy actually reflects over 55% of the actual economy. And so if you unravel the social fabric from which the gift economy emerges, you end up losing the top of the iceberg as well. All of a sudden, to make deals, you have to make more contracts, more legalizations, more enforcement, more laws. And this is what we are experiencing in so many places, yeah? Okay, to get to the bias. Human beings, God had a dream that they would live faithfully with God, with one another, with the place that God had called them. You remember in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, there's a hidden sort of placement that God gives the people. We remember all the initial commands, but we forget the other limitation. It was a particular place, particular rivers that ran through it, a particular garden that God said, live into this with faithfulness, care for it. So my bias is human beings are made, are made to learn how to fit together in place. And in the U.S., I was raised in a context where places have been unraveled. I grew up, and the best thing I had for the meaning of neighborhood was Mr. Rogers. Is this something that you know about over here? Okay, I see. Yes, I see. Ah, there's lying happening. Mr. Rogers, uh, 
That's the best I knew of the meaning of neighborhood. Because everyone was moving so fast, right? You, you, you went to school in one place. You slept in one place. You went out to eat in one place. You went to the grocery store in one place. You went to the park in one place. You took your kids to the sports game at one place. And you're moving, moving, moving. And you're moving so quickly that what Manuel Castells, the great sociologist, says we took our places and we turned them into spaces of flows. And what he meant to say by that is we come in to do one activity and then we come out. We come in to go to the school, we go out. We come in to sleep and we go out. And we come in to go to the grocery store and we go out. And slowly that place that held story, that held characters, that where you could be known, that place, I remember my mother weeping tears and sitting me down one day and said, son, Paul, I'm so sorry because when... I was a kid, my parents would point out to me, Sally, if you want to grow up well, follow that character. Hang out with these people. Go down to the corner street and you'll find somebody who has been a hero in our neighborhood for many, many years. Listen and learn from their life, right? She said, I'm so sorry, Paul. All you've had your whole life because of our circumstances here on the West Coast is movie stars and sports figures. And Paul, you couldn't even get close enough to them to know what they're really like. We turned our places that held story, characters, connection with the land, we unraveled them so that now I live in this, uh, I live in this neighborhood of Hilltop Tacoma and you can drive downtown and drive down Fawcett Avenue that runs right through the middle of it and there'll be two tall skyscrapers and they'll have little tiny slits for windows at the top of those skyscrapers. This is where they send old people to be irrelevant, die, and basically have no more connection with any common life, right? And so someone can live in those towers, I kid you not, they can live there for two years, three years, four years, five years, and not a single solitary person will know that they exist. Not a single solitary people, person can say, you know what, I belong to you, and you belong to me. When you suffer, I suffer. When you rejoice, I rejoice. We're part of the same community, the same ecology, the same place, and we belong to one another. And so there are characters all over my community, some holding signs, some carrying out other marginalized activities, and those of us who are running at the speed of lightning to escape faithful engagement, faithful presence, cannot see them. And here's the invisible movement. The invisible movement is God is up to something, God is moving in the hearts of people who are returning towards this faithful engagement, and it's happening across every neighborhood that I have explored as I cross the United States, as I cross Canada. We're in trouble. Don't get me wrong. We're in serious trouble. And everyone said, do you say amen here? Okay, I know you're quieter here. But it's, it, you, you got to help me. Uh, we're in trouble, amen? Right? But, and here's the hope, something is springing up and sprouting up, but the problem is it's on the ground, it's in the everyday lives, it's in the homes, it's on the streets, it's in the gardens, and if all you're measuring is how many butts, what your budgets are, and what your buildings look like, you miss the invisible movement. You miss what's really happening. Because the only way you can get after it is if you get outside the building and you get into the everyday lives of people and you discover something you didn't know was going down. The other thing is that often as we meet groups of people, churches of every sort and every size that are re-engaging, oftentimes we meet them and we sit down together and they say, Paul, this is, 
this is, you know, we love trying to re-engage with the community and we're, we're getting into it and we're learning how to be present here in ways that, uh, that don't tear this place apart, that don't, it's not toxic charity, it's not manipulating people, it's not going at them with, you know, inappropriate agendas, it's not uh, uh, toxic forms of, of connection. We're, we're here, we're present, but Paul, we're alone and this is hard and we feel like this is, we feel like the stuff we're doing you know, it's small stuff. I remember one woman sitting in a small circle of people, and as I began to share about how people are re-engaging and becoming present, she, she comes up to me and a tear in her eye, and she says, Paul, if what you were talking about is actually true, you just redeemed the last 12 years of my life. She said, I used to be in sort of a full-time professionalized ministry role. But then my husband divorced me. The, the church said I could no longer serve in that capacity. I had three children. I was broke. All I could do, all I could do was be present in the common spaces of my neighborhood, have the children that were in my neighborhood join in with my children and we play together in the park. And she said, day after day, all, we, all I could do was be there. And what you're saying, Paul, is that actually matters. You're saying that actually is part of the work of faithful presence in the neighborhood. It's actually what we're called toward. Okay, so, so my bias is that God is lighting up our neighborhoods. Like if you could have some sort of giant Batman light and you could kind of shine it down and somehow it would illuminate every character in your parish that, first of all, it would illuminate every character that says, I'm a follower of Jesus and I want to love my neighbor in some way. Maybe they don't have the full picture. Maybe they don't use the word ecology of relationships, but they're there. And if you could see the light shine down, I think you might be shocked at the number of lights that would go on across the parish of those characters. And then if you turned it on to phase two and it began to light up every person that the Spirit of God is working in in deep and profound ways, every person with redemptive hopes and dreams, everyone with longings for shalom and peace and goodness to reside across their neighborhood, I think all kinds more lights would begin to shine on. And then if you said, well, some people really aren't that cool, but if I could turn it on to phase three and I could see every person created in the image of God, Every person for whom has deep desires planted within them, born of goodness because they're created in that image. How many more lights might go on across that place? So many. And then if you could go beyond even that, and then you could say, how many plants, buildings, rivers, animals, streets, sidewalks might long grown for even the revelation of the sons and daughters of God and the shalom, the lying down of lion and lamb together, all of a sudden even more lights would go on. And you know what I believe about it? I believe there's a living body in this place, but the problem is the body is dismembered. It is dismembered. It is disconnected. It is, you can have someone living across the street from you or working in a small business with redemptive hopes or walking their dog and because they don't participate in the same expression you participate in or because in the U.S. if uh, one person says no, you got to sprinkle them and the other says no, you got to dunk them under the water, somehow when it comes to the parish, they're invisible. They're not part of that living body that God longs to See, remembered, reconnected, reengaged. So the question that comes up for me is one, how do we remember the body? How do we enter in with faithful presence in a way that might bring about healing of this ecology that has been torn apart? Number two, it would be to ask the question how can our tradition? And our gatherings 
become living in such a way that what we do on Sunday actually empowers and strengthens us for the kind of people that we want to be in the place that God has called us on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? So that when we break that bread and we take that cup together, and of course we go and forgive all those whom we have an offense, as the scripture says, and then we eat that bread and take that cup knowing that we reside in communion with the Spirit of God and with one another in that place, but that is a practice, it is a memory, it is a remembrance so that we might live in communion, so that we might live with forgiveness and grace towards one another every single day, yes? I remember when I first began trying to be present in my neighborhood. I had a few others. Elizabeth and I, she, she could tell you the funny stories. We had, we had no idea what we were doing. On top of that, we couldn't get along with each other because we never tried to live together in a way where we could actually share real things. It's kind of like Facebook back when we started doing this. Uh, you'd, have a, you'd have a circle of friends, and then whenever they do something that you didn't like, you just delete them and move on to a new set of friends, right? And so we, we had no idea what it meant to actually commit to one another, commit to a more shared way of living life together. And so we got into the neighborhood and we really sucked at it. It was really bad, right? And so on a, on a good note, the community at large finally got a chance to see what Christians look like when they share life together, but on a bad note, it looked really bad, right? However, we started celebrating things that we'd never celebrated before. So we had testimony meetings. How many of you remember the old days when a missionary was about to get ready to hit the road and go to another country? And you'd, you know, you'd bring them up front. Uh, you'd, you'd have people praying for them. Maybe, maybe if you you know, believe in the Spirit, you might have people put their hand on them and be praying. And, and uh, everybody would be just like, okay, we're going to send you. You're going to go. We're going to be behind you. We're going to be praying. And then they go. And then six months later, they come back, and they've got uh, those little slides or the little pictures in them. And you click those things, and you see all the stories of what they had done. Everybody would be like, yes, God is moving. Just pass up an offering and send it back out again. You remember this? Here's what our testimony meetings became in this little neighborhood of Hilltop Tacoma. Our testimony meetings would be, this is how grand they were. It'd be like, I just want to praise God because this week I was walking down the sidewalk and I ran into Sister Nicole and she was on the way to the cafe and we had a spontaneous meeting on the same sidewalk in the same neighborhood together. And everyone in the congregation, which was about 12 of us, would be like, oh, praise God. God is so good. And any visitors who came would just be looking at us like, you people are just weird. But let me just tell you, for us, for us whose lives were so fragmented and splintered to actually see one another in everyday life, it was like, for the first time in our lives, we were being the church in real life together. It was fabulous. And so we started celebrating every small win like that. Somebody would come in and say, I met the barista down at this coffee shop. Her name is Patricia. And somebody else across the room would be like, I know Patricia. I met Patricia last week, and Patricia, she, you know what? She's got some really amazing things she's doing in the neighborhood. Oh, and she's struggling with this, and everybody would pray for Patricia, and then people would go and visit Patricia throughout the week, and we would rejoice together over the smallest things. And you know what? That's what we got to do. If we want to live back into this, as Peter Block, the, the sociologist who co-wrote The Abundant Community and The Structure of Belonging and books like this. He once sat down with me and said, Paul, you want to see things change? You got to count. You got to change what counts as news. You got to change what counts as news. And that's what we did. We started, we started supporting and encouraging and celebrating together everyday presence in the neighborhood. Even when we did bad stuff. It's like you know what, I really messed it up this week and I had to go back and, and uh, forgive someone. And everybody in our community would be like, you know what, Paul, this might be the first time that you've been in the same context with the same people long enough to have 70 times 7 offenses. It's good. Get the forgiving done and move on. 
So, sister, how much time I got? Keep me on track here. When I got about five minutes, just, you know, keep me, in, keep me in the loop. So, faithful presence. On the one side, and that's garden story, that primal garden story. On the one side, the first thing Adam and Eve did in that context, they grasped after God. They grasped after knowledge of good and evil the way that God had it. Like, we want to know everything for all places. We want to, what I call, transcend limitations. So God called them to a specific place. God gave them a body with limitations. And the serpent comes and says, you eat this, you're going to know like God. You're going to transcend those limitations. How many of you in this room have ever been in a situation when you took on more than you should have? <laughs> oh, it happens in New Zealand, I see. Okay. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you tried to control things you shouldn't try to control? Right? Yes. On the one side, in the very first move, they try to grasp at being like God. But on the second move, and this is the irony of it, the second move that ejects them from faithful presence is they switch gears and now they don't want to be like God. Now they don't even want to take responsibility for being human. And they blame one another instead of taking responsibility for their agency in the situation. They blame the serpent and they avoid responsibility. Oh, this is going to be fun. I get the deep pleasure now of talking about responsibilities and limitations. In the U.S., that one doesn't go over very well. So on the one, we see this in, in our world. We see this movement, don't we? We see this movement uh, uh, in our own lives. We try to control something. We take on more than we should. We try to make our agendas happen. It spins out of control. We start blaming people. We start blaming one another. We say we can't do anything. This, thing's, this thing is out of control. It's far too complex. And we give up altogether and we avoid responsibility and the whole cycle kind of starts over again. We see it in our churches. Pastors, priests, many ministry leaders. People like me that try to make everything happen according to our agendas. And we have the exact theological answer for every single question on the planet as if we knew all things for all places and all times. Ah, but then there are the congregation members who like it that way and avoid responsibility for participation, for engagement, for a mutual body coming together to be a living instrument of God. We see this, uh, you remember, remember back when the modern generation knew the answer for everything, had all the scientific facts, could tell you the, the exact equations for every answer that you needed, and then the poor souls, the Gen Xers were born, the postmoderns were born, and the postmoderns weren't buying it. I was in Seattle, I know this, ba weird bands, weird amalgamations like Nirvana came into existence. We didn't, the boomers had no idea what to do with these kind of people. You, you, you could not bring any sense to them, right? Your facts, your figures, your solutions, your success stories, how the world works. You weren't, the postmoderns weren't buying any of it. In fact, it went from, I know all the answers, I know all the facts, I know all the rational things, to, dude, there ain't no truth, right? There's no answers. There's no way forward. In the middle of that place is faithful presence, and faithful presence is a relational word, Instead of ejecting from faithful presence by controlling or by avoiding our agency and our, our, our capacity to, to enter in, faithful presence says, risk the relationships. So for, to give you an example, Elizabeth is here tonight, so I can't say some of the things I'd like to, but I can easily say, even still, I have a tendency at times to think I've got her figured out. Right? I have absolved all the mystery. And I have set up an equation where if I do this, 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 and this, she will do this, 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 and this for me. Unfortunately, 
my wife has this sort of sixth sense, and my technique to get my outcomes lasts for about 11 seconds before she reads it, and it begins to distance the relationship. It begins to cause friction and separation, and, and, and at bare minimum, she says some really hard things that I don't want to hear, right? And she's nice. On the other hand, if I say, after trying to control the situation, if I say to myself, you know what? This woman, she is pure mystery. She is impossible. She is complex beyond complex, and there isn't even a way to step into this thing. And I say, forget it. I'm not even going to try. Let me just tell you all, with honest humility, that is worse than the first option, right? Worse than the first option. What Elizabeth longs for is for me to shut up, listen, turn from my controlling agenda, get creative after I've listened, have some imagination about it, and risk my way into something that might bring us closer together and give it a try. Unfortunately, I still screw it up. Even after all that, I still get it wrong, right? But here's the difference. That sixth sense kicks in. She looks at me and she says, Paul, I love you so much. You still didn't quite get it right, but let, let's just tweak it just a little bit and just know this. I know where your heart was. I know where you were at. I know what your longing was, and the rest of it we can work out as we go. Don't you think this is what God is hoping for in our relationship? Don't you think God isn't about if I follow this set of rules, say this set of prayers, answer this set of codes, and then I can get the outcomes I wanted from God? Right? That's not God. On the other hand, God isn't one to say, just forget the whole thing, it's too hard. Risk the relationship. But here's where I want to get to on this. That's what our parish needs. That's what our neighborhood needs. That's what this ecology of relationship needs. It doesn't need someone coming in who says, I got it all sorted out. I got the answers. You're the problem. I am the cure. Right? That's not what the neighborhood needs. On the other hand, the neighborhood doesn't need someone who says, you know what? I can't deal with you. I can't touch it. Right? I got my own little isolated uh, bubble, my own religious circle, and I'm good to go. The neighborhood needs us to say, I'm going to risk the relationship. There's a set of relationships here in this parish that has been broken and unraveled and fractured and fragmented, but the Spirit of God's on the move here, and I'm going to risk joining in with what God's doing. And I might get it wrong, but I'll be there the next day right? That's one of the beauties about the, about the parish, is you're there the next day, and you got to deal with the consequences, right? Like, I could have I gotten on the airplane, come over here, on the way, somebody could have made me upset, I could have flipped them off, said some curse words, you know, got in a fist fight, and then st stood up here and said, God bless you, everyone, I'm going to share with you about loving your neighbor. You would have never known the difference, right? But then I must go home, and there in my home, if I do that to my neighbors, they're going to call me on it the very next day. And this is the furnace, the forge, that God uses to put us on our knees and say, God, Spirit of the living God, I need your strength, your power, your transforming goodness so that I can face those who are different from me and I can enter in peacefully, gracefully, mercifully, Anybody know what the first word of the gospel is? Ooh. Yep, John the Baptist said it. Paul said it. Peter said it. So many said it. First word is repent. And I think, you know, if you're buying into my heresies so far, I think that the next move, if we believe that there is this ecology that's fundamental, the next move is to say, what does repentance look like? If we are doing all kinds of strategies to eject ourselves from faithful presence, 
Repentance is to turn 180 degrees to long for, pray for, risk your way toward re-entering that fabric in a faithful, life-giving, healing sort of way. We do a lot of things to eject ourselves out. We do things like, like I could draw an arrow that ejects us from faithful presence and I could call it ideology. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? What, what was it that kept the Levite and the priest from faithful presence? I think it was ideology. I think they got the list of codes and laws that they could use to say, don't touch a person who's, who's got blood on them, and they could sidestep them with their ideology, right? Our codes, our ideologies, our ways of thinking, we've got it all figured out, and somehow we end up with gatherings that do not reflect the kind of people that Jesus was touching, that Jesus was connecting with. Somehow we've built religious circles and, and groups that have nothing in common with the kind of characters that Jesus was engaged with. How has it happened? I think a large part is ideology. Another thing we could say, uh, we could say speed. The crazy thing about speed, the philosopher Paul Virilio just died a couple months ago. They called him the prophet of speed because he began to speak about how speed actually changes your environment. So you're on a light uh, uh, you're on a train that's, that's running at the speed of light and you look outside to see a human being and all you see is a blur, right? Our lives get moving so fast through cars, through technologies, through tools, through all these different strategies that we lose sight of people and our speed causes us not to... I mean, we could go on commodification, individualism, the words go on and on for the strategies that we have given. How about I ask this question? When you think about your context, what's something that maybe only a hundred years ago you used to receive from community and now there's another way where you get it elsewhere? What would come up for you? What, what would you think, uh, what could you say, you used to receive this from community and now you get it elsewhere? Here's an example. Maybe you'd say, Facebook offers community, right? Well, where did you used to get that? In the neighborhood, right? Okay, nothing wrong with Facebook, not down in Facebook, although we could come up with some reasons it's not too good, but nothing wrong with social media. What other things could you think of? The, the news. Oh, yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, absolutely. Uh, some people uh, spend incredible amounts of time listening to news from all over the world and don't have a clue what's going on with their next door neighbor. Absolutely. What else? Food. Ooh, easy, easy. Food, right? We don't know where our food comes from. We think it drops down into little plastic packages in the U.S., right? We don't know where our clothes come from. We've lost all contact, right? What else? Technology. Say it again. Technology, yeah, absolutely. We use technology. Now, again, none of these necessarily in and of themselves wrong. Tools separate us from something. If I used to garden with my hands, right? Imagine this. I'm down, hands plunged into the earth, right? I'm carving stuff out. It's having effects on my fingers. I'm feeling the soil, etc. And then I get a shovel. It's going to have different effects on different muscles, different parts of my body, and while bridging to the earth, it's also going to disconnect me from it in some ways, yeah? Now suppose I get a shovel that's really, really long, and it takes me right outside my neighborhood, right? This is what, uh, I mean, I know I'm getting freaky on this, but like a cell phone. I always say cell phones split your consciousness because you have to be present in two places at once. You have to be able to understand what's going on in the context with the person you're speaking and your context at the same time, which essentially splits your capacity to be present, right? Nothing wrong with the phone, but again, it's another shovel that takes you out of the presence in the neighborhood. 
One over here. Yes. Oh, yep. Entertainment. Massive. Massive. You can, nowadays you can walk into rooms and even though people are there, they're not there. Right? Anybody experience that? I remember once when I was waiting tables at a restaurant and two guys had the, uh, just like this thing right here, uh, and they were both phones, but they were both faced in a direction where I couldn't see them, and they were talking to one another uh, on their phones, uh, literally right there, right? And I, and, they, and I came up to the table, and they were talking at each other, even though they were right there at the table. It was the weirdest thing. Hey, let's go one more. Yes. Say again. Cars, yeah. You can make a pretty good case that communities began the serious fragmentation and unraveling at the beginning of the car and have accelerated ever since, right? Again, the cars, bad, no. It's another shovel. And it's when you add all the shovels together that you find yourself completely lacking a place where you can be known and you can know others. A place where that person up in that tower can become a living member of a community. A place where you can remember the body that has been broken and fragmented and pressed apart. Jesus comes on the scene, and I'll finish with this tonight. In Jesus' day, I like to say everyone lived in a walkable community. You get this, yes? There were no cars. It's supposed to be kind of funny. That's a uh, New Zealand laugh. Uh, <clears throat> I'll move on. Uh, and there were no cars, so essentially everybody was living in context uh, for the most part. In Jesus' day, the problem was who got excluded from life and community, right? Jesus comes on the scene as the Old Testament Walter Brueggemann says, in the Hebrew, the word life meant to be included in life and community with God, with each other, and with the place that God had called them. Death was not the cessation of breath. Death was to be excluded from that life and community because who wants to have everlasting life if you're excluded from relationships? That's not life. Jesus comes on the scene, and everything Jesus is doing is to help people who have been excluded from life and community to enter back in. From the parables, to the miracles, to the stories, to the actions, everything he's doing is bringing those who have been excluded back in. He touches, he touches the leper. Go, show yourself to the priest. Why? The priest had the certificate. The priest shows you the certificate, you get a clean bill of health, you can enter back into life and community. The woman touches the hem of Jesus' garment, boom, massive reversal. What happened if an unclean person touched you? You became unclean and you had to go outside the community for a time of purification. In Jesus' case, the woman becomes clean and re-enters life and community. The Gentiles, those people who were different than them, those people in my context that might be Native American or might be uh, uh, African American or might come as an immigrant or refugee, Gentiles, the woman s says, even the, even the dogs get the scraps from the table. And Jesus says, great is your faith. Only two people Jesus said this of, the Gentile woman and the Roman centurion. Outsiders included back in life. And I could go on story after story after story. I'll tell you one more. Anybody remember back in the old days, what was it called? Uh, they put the uh, flannel graph. You had those too. That's so weird how stuff goes all across the world and we sing the same songs and have the same 10 minute breaks and have the same announcements. And that's a weird thing. Flannel graphs. The picture for me, it was, uh, it was always, unfortunately, a white blonde Jesus, but he'd be sitting on a log or something like that, 
little children would be all over, one on his knee, one hanging on his neck, people, children of all colors sitting all around him. And Jesus would say, as the teacher would tell us, let the children come unto me and forbid them not. And then he would tell them, unless you become like one of these, you cannot even enter the kingdom. You can't even get started with this kingdom business. In Jesus' day, children were like second class. They didn't receive all the benefits of life and community. And a great reversal, Jesus says, no, this is the very beginning of it. We could talk about stories of women that Jesus included who were once second class citizens. We could tell so many stories. Jesus comes on that scene and includes people back in. And here's what I want to say at the end of this. The sad thing is that we have lost the very foundation from which to include people back in. In my country, I won't speak for yours, in my country, we have unraveled the very platform, the very community life from which we could include people who have been fragmented, broken, lost, displaced. Friends, the hopeful news is we can do this because we are serving a God who longs for this dream to happen. We can do this not by making it happen, not by forcing it, but by resting in God, having faith. As Walter Brueggemann once told me, I sat with him at a meal and, he, and I was mad at him because he had, he had been talking about empire and neighborhood He'd been talking about the Pharaoh system versus the parish, and he said, Paul, I'm just going to tell you straightforward, the neighborhood is like the desert that the, Egyptian, or that the Israelites came out of when they fled Egypt. And I said, the desert? Why is it the desert? I want it to be the promised land. How are we going to get anybody to go there if we call it the desert? And he said, Paul, it's the desert because the neighborhood in our time is the place where all of our life support systems are shut off. It's the place where we're all, where we used to go and get the leeks and the onions and all the things back at the Pharaoh system. We don't think that there's anything that can be provided for in the neighborhood. It's the place that has been deserted, right? And he said, Paul, it's gonna require faith to re-enter the neighborhood and believe that God's abundance will begin to grow as we join together in community, as we pray together, as we trust God, as we lean in on Jesus, that we can do this not by controlling it, not by grasping at it, not by forcing it to happen. Imagine if Jesus did that. Imagine, just picture, just picture this. Jesus is trying to control the outcomes. He's trying to force church growth, trying to bring the shalom of all things through his power and his strength. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross that day when people are spitting at him, cursing his name, the disciples have run off, Peter's denied him three times, everybody's gone. Can you imagine if Jesus is up there on the cross and he's like, I said all the right prayers. I followed the codes, I did all the rules, and the outcomes just aren't looking the way that I wanted them to. No, the outcomes weren't up to the sun, right? The outcomes weren't up to the sun. So the beautiful thing about that is we can enter in by faith and we don't have to grasp at it, we just have to risk our way forward. 